To all the moms, moms of children who are still at home or all grown up, moms who've outlived a son or daughter, or moms of babies they never got to hold, moms who've raised kids all on their own or became a mom to someone who needed one, moms of children who have wandered from God or the longing to be moms who are still waiting. God perfectly arranged each of you into the role you have today. His word recognizes you as capable, strong, and praiseworthy. Everything you do makes our lives more beautiful. Happy Mother's Day. Hey, good morning, Riverside. Isn't that, isn't that good? Yes. Hey, Amen. I would love for us all to just give an applause to all the moms. Thank you. Uh. Oh, you can do better than that. You can do better than that. <laughs> hey, Amen. That is so good. Uh, and as we get started this morning, I just want to offer a prayer uh, for all the moms love the way that that video uh, said that and uh, it's just beautiful to see everyone here I, I see some uh, more casual I see some more formal I see some of you all taking me back to my younger days where all the ladies wore hats back in the uh, ancient days of old <laughs> but <laughs> I love it though I love it come on <laughs> let me pray for us let me hasten to the throne. <laughs> Let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to acknowledge uh, the importance of motherhood, and we want to first give thanks that you are such a loving parent to us all. All life was born through you, and in you all creation is nurtured. You formed us in your image. You gathered us together. You've united us as members of one family. We're grateful. And so we give you thanks today for uh, the mothers among us. We ask that you strengthen them, that you, Lord, grant them wisdom, patience, persistence, courage, peace. Thank you for all uh, motherly figures, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, wives, stepmothers, foster mothers, guardians, babysitters, many others who practice self-sacrifice and embody compassion. Lord, grant them strength to carry on their work and, and the realization that this is such a high and holy privilege. So even amid, amid this day, this celebration, Lord, um, many have restless spirits and they're reluctant to name the difficulties of this day. For some, this day brings the sorrowful awareness of their own inability to conceive children. Lord, would you draw your tender spirit near? Remind them that those who struggle with infertility have always shared a special place in your heart. For some, this day is marked by loneliness and grief as they spend this Mother's Day as a widower, an orphan, a parent who's lost a child. Lord, to those today who live in the wake of the loss of a loved one, Lord, would you grant glimpses of the resurrection? Would you allow them to look into the future with hope? Lord, for some, this is a day that brings to the surface some ongoing tensions that exist in personal relationships and family dynamics. We're asking you, God, for healing from the wounds of our past. We ask for a path for forgiveness for wrongs, both experienced and committed. We ask that as a God of restoration, the God of reconciliation, that you would build and rebuild bonds of honesty, truth, and love. So we give you thanks today for the wide spectrum of motherhood among us for all the moms, new mothers, young mothers, 
uh, mothers of grown children, mothers of, and grandmothers of advanced years, uh, frail in body but strong in spirit. Lord, through them we have a constant reminder that though our lives are marked by transition, change, and time, your love for all your children remains the same. So God, remind us on this Mother's Day to live with a childlike faith, a childlike faith, curious to the wonders of your truth and also obedient to every command. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to say good morning again, everyone, and uh, we're grateful to have you here, especially if it's your first time here. Uh, we really do appreciate you choosing to worship the Lord with each and every one of us. Um, do hope you feel welcomed, and more importantly, you'll experience the love of our Lord Jesus today while you're here. Our, I want to bring you greetings as well uh, from Pastor Brian. Uh, he was in California this weekend to perform uh, a wedding, and so he will be here next week. He's going to continue our series in 1 Corinthians called Growing Together. Everybody say Growing Together. Growing together. Oh, that sounds good. So glad to be a part of a church that is appreciating the process of growth, doing it together. And so although we're not continuing that series, I do want to uh, do want us to turn in our Bibles today, in our Bibles, in your apps, it'll also be on the screen, to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And I'm going to say that famous uh, preacher statement, I won't be before you long today. Oh boy, it doesn't sound like you believe that, but I'm going to do my best. Let's put it that way. Today I want to talk about passing along a living faith. Passing along a living faith. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. It's a letter to Paul the Apostle's protege named Timothy. It starts off this way. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, my beloved child. Now, Timothy is not his natural son, uh, but that doesn't impact the love that he has for Timothy and his devotion toward Timothy. We read in Acts chapter 16 that Paul uh, met Timothy as he was going from city to city and he was strengthening the different churches in the city that he helped in the different cities that he helped to plant. And he met Timothy in a city called Lystra. Uh, we're told that Timothy was the son uh, of a Jewish believer, a follower of Jesus, and also a Gentile, a Greek Gentile, who was not a believer in Jesus. His mother was a believer, his father was not. But he had a great reputation, young Timothy did, and he was ready to minister. So Paul took him on his journey with him and his team, uh, and they went to different churches. Acts 6, 16 verse 5 says that, with this team, the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers greatly. In other words, the church was growing as a result of their ministry. Let's move on. So chapter, verse 2, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Reason I want to use this text uh, is because as we sit here, I am sure that there are several Timothys in here. I'm just using that as a broad term. You could be a, 
a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl, but there are several Timothys here, beloved children, young men and women, middle-aged men and women, doesn't matter, young and knowing about God, no matter the age, Timothys. And they're ready to bring the gospel to this whole world. Sometimes because of this modern day and age using communications and, and methods and channels that we've not even thought of yet. You see the rise of artificial intelligence at one point in time. Uh, some of us are, are, have, still don't have a TikTok account. Some of you don't even know what TikTok is, but we've moved on. And here's what it means for those of us who are mothers and fathers. It doesn't mean that we're out of touch. It doesn't mean that we're irrelevant. It doesn't mean that we are insignificant. It means that God has given us an opportunity to pass on a living faith, to pass on a living faith. We get to pass on to them a strong, sincere, living faith saturated in the word of God. And it shows up in their lives like a sincere faith that can be fanned into a fire that approaches the world with truth and compassion and authority and love and self-control and courage. Riverside, we're growing together. And so, mothers, we need you. Fathers, we need you. Aunties and uncles, we need you. Big brothers and big sisters, we need you. And as uh, you play an active role in the discipleship of one another, we grow together because we are a united family. How many of you all believe that? Yes. We're a family. Family is it's just one of the metaphors uh, that God uses in the word of God to talk about how we're united to Christ and to one another. We've learned in our series in 1 Corinthians that we're uh, a field it says in chapter one. It also says that we're a building and Jesus is the chief cornerstone of that building, right? Talks about the fact that we're a temple where the spirit of Christ lives, that we're a body and Christ is the head. We're a family. God is our father. And you know, uh, Hebrews two tells us that Jesus calls us brothers and sisters. Did you know that? He calls us brothers and sisters because we're the children of God and we're joint inheritors of everything that God the Father is giving to Jesus Christ, his son. Amen? So Timothy's are here. Mothers are here. Fathers are here. And obviously, I'm not just talking about mothers and fathers to just your natural children or those that you have responsibility for naturally. In a very real way, those of us who are in the body of Christ, we have, people in this room, those who are a part of the body of Christ, we have an eternal relationship that transcends over time. So if there is somebody here in the body of Christ that you don't like, you've got to get, make it right with them because you're going to see them for eternity. You can't get rid of them. Amen? And so we're growing together. We, we have, God is giving us the opportunity in order to invest in one another in a very real way because we're growing together. So Paul writes this letter, 2 Timothy, to his beloved child in the faith, and he says, I'm reminded, verse 5, of your sincere faith a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. He notes that a sincere faith was passed on from his grandmother to his mother to him. From his grandmother to his mother to him. Now, I don't know, as Timothy was growing up, how much different his grandmother Lois's life was from Timothy's life. If you knew your grandparents at all, you know that since they're so much older than you, they grew up in a much different time. Uh, my grandfather was born around the turn of the century 
in Ulster Spring, Jamaica. And even when my parents were children there, there was no, uh, no internet. Can you believe that? No internet. Neither was there inside plumbing. Neither was there electricity. There was no Publix. There was no Chick-fil-A. Can you believe that? News came in newspapers. Mail came in mailboxes or post office boxes. Uh, there, and there were innovations that for them didn't exist even 100 years before them. Life changes, right? All types of things change. But you know what doesn't change? What doesn't change is the word of God. What doesn't change is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why you can pass that on and that can be the greatest investment that is made in our lives and in the lives of those who are in this church in every generation. And so what's the best investment you can make? Uh, it's the word of God so that those who are here in the body of Christ can enter the world and those that were passing this faith on can enter the world courageously, without fear, uh, with knowledge, with love, and with self-discipline. We pass on a living, sincere faith. Paul calls it a sincere faith, a sincere faith. This refers to more than just a feeling or uh, a, a feeling that he has or a feeling that you get from him. Sometimes when someone speaks, uh, you may not know whether or not they're telling the truth, but, but you, ever, you ever said, man, they kind of sound sincere. I'm not sure I actually believe them, but they sound sincere. Well, this is not that. This is not talking about just a feeling. This word uh, that, that's translated from Greek to English and we, we translate it as sincere, it's talking about a faith that is unquestionably real. It's without hypocrisy. It, it stresses the absence of hypocrisy, of any feigning, of any falsifying, any embellishment, any exaggeration. It's real. It's real. And when, when you uh, receive a sincere apology, it's easier to forgive because you know the apology is real at that point. When you're sincere, when you're truly sincere, people know where you stand and they know where they stand with you. Now, Timothy, we find in scriptures, he may have been insecure in some social settings. He was uh, uh, sometimes a, he had a lot of work to do as a leader and to grow in his faith. But he was strong in his faith. He, he wasn't wishy-washy in his faith. He learned to be sincere in his faith. But how did he get there? How did Timothy come to saving faith? Bible tells us that we're saved by God's grace through faith, and it's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God by believing in Jesus Christ alone that he lived for our righteousness that he died for our sins, that he rose from the dead so that we could become the children of God. We now receive a faith that leads us to repentance and causes us to begin to follow Jesus. But the Bible tells us in Romans 10 verse 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. One, one translation says faith comes from what is heard and what is heard is the message about Christ. And this is the good news. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and what is the message about Christ? Well, really, it's the entire Bible. There was one time when, when Jesus rose from the dead and he was talking to some disciples on the way to Emmaus and it says that he opened up to them, he interpreted to them everything that was in the scriptures concerning himself, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. So how did Timothy come to faith? Well, it started with the word of God. If you look with me at chapter three in this same letter, verse 14 says this, but as for you, Paul is still talking to Timothy and he says, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation 
through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy's faith in God started in the word of God. And who taught him the word of God? He learned it from childhood. He learned it from his mother and also from his grandmother. Paul says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Now the point here is not, is not that you must come to faith as a child and grow up in the church. So many of us in here today have come to faith much later than our childhood. And there's so many examples in the word of God and in our own lives of people who God called and, and came to faith much later in life. The point here is the intentional nature of the way that Lois and Eunice discipled Timothy and then the opportunity that we have to do the same with the Timothys that God has given us in our family. So it was a sincere faith, but it was also a living faith. Everybody say it was a living faith. So the Bible says here that this faith dwelt first in Lois. Means it lived in Lois and lived in Eunice and now lives in him. Now this, this no doubt means, can refer to a few things. The Holy Spirit is living in them. Christ is living in them. But a living faith is something else. It's Christ living in us and through us. Living in us and through us. It's the Holy Spirit living in us, influencing all of our actions and influencing our motivations and influencing our decisions, conforming us to the image of Christ. Because of our faith, how we live is so impactful to those we're discipling. Passing on a living faith, get ready parents, is not telling people do as I say, but not as I do. Have you ever done that? I know I have. Our kids look at us and say, but, but, but. No, 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 no. Just do what I tell you to do. <laughs> Don't watch what I'm doing. But the sad truth is that children, young people, anybody that's following you tends to mimic what you do much more than they mimic what you say. Isn't that right? Paul knew this. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. He says to, in 2 Timothy 3.10 to Timothy, he says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me. And, and let me hasten to say this. If you have saving faith and we are passing that faith on to one another in a way that encourages people, in a way that... Uh, begins to put that sincere faith through the word of God and even through our example because of what God will do in people's lives. If your experiences are not all positive, they don't disqualify you from helping to encourage somebody else. What they do is they make that faith less black and white and more color. What do I mean by that? Well, our faith in God is our foundation in times of trouble. Our faith in God is our foundation even in times of regret. Our faith in God is our foundation even in times of repentance. So that's when maybe younger people, maybe somebody that you're discipling, maybe somebody that you are passing the faith on to, uh, I think we can just be honest with them about even some of our regrets, some of our mistakes. When one of our children can look at, at us and say, wait a minute, you did what? Now, I'm not saying you have to tell them everything all the time. Wait until they're ready. But they can say, you did what? And God forgave you? You did what? Maybe there was a time you doubted God. And you can let somebody know, I doubted God, but God strengthened my faith in him. You learn what the word of God said. Uh, you believed what God promised. You prayed according to the promises of God. And God answered that 
prayer. These are not things to hide under a rug. These are things to pass on. Now, you don't need to go to TikTok and make a video about it. You just need to find somebody here in the body of Christ who needs to be encouraged, not just from the word of God, but also from our experiences because we have a living faith. Amen? I'm praying that God would help us to be a community, a family that regularly and passionately and consistently passes on the faith. And here's why passing on a living faith is important. Timothy had a gift from God that needed to be ignited to bless the world. Look at what he says in, in verse 5. I'm sorry, in verse 6. For this reason, because of your sincere faith that I'm sure dwells in you, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Listen, imagine this church 10 years into the future. Are you there with me? Can you imagine this church 20 years into the future with a bunch of Timothys that have been poured into by you and they're solid in the word of God and they're sincere in their faith? And they're approaching their lives and, and they're, they're approaching this world and they're approaching their communities with the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit operating powerfully in their lives with no fear, with power, with love, with discipline. How many of you all know those are the keys to success in almost any area of life, right? But how many of us would want to enter Life and every situation with courage, with, with authority. If I don't understand it, I, I'm not confused about it. I know that I can go to God and pray about it. I know that I can go to my brothers and sisters, my mothers and my fathers in faith, and they will help me pray about it. We enter every situation with the love of God. We enter every situation with great discernment and high IQ, EQ, I should say, to understand where people are in their various situations in life. And we respond to them. We respond even to the world, not necessarily as enemies, but as people who need to experience the love of God. And to top it all off, we have the discipline, the self-control, uh, to be consistent, to persevere in every area of life, to consistently pray, to consistently uh, give, to rest, to communicate, even eat and treat our bodies in a way that glorifies God with our bodies and with our minds. Paul is reminding Timothy, this is what God gave you. This is what God gave you through your grandmother through your mother. This is what God is committing to you. And this is what God is giving us today. Young person, middle-aged person, older person, doesn't matter. Each and every one of us have someone that we're looking to and someone that is looking to us. And may God grant us the strength to pass on a living faith. And when we pass on the faith, we are allowing our children, our young people, our, our young married couples, those who are single, those who are in college, uh, those who are in vocational college, entrepreneurs, executives. We're, we're, we're empowering them to receive this living faith, a faith that helps them to understand that every good and perfect gift that they receive, that they have, is not just from their, themselves. It comes from the Father of lights above. And they invest in that gift to see that this church catches fire and brings this fire of God, this gospel of Jesus Christ, this good news, this hope for the world into all of this community, into all of South Florida, into our entire country and all around the world. Amen. To the glory of God. I want to encourage each and every one of us to pass on a living faith. 
much like grandmother Lois did, much like mother Eunice did, passing it on to the young Timothys that are here among us. May God grant us that because he is so merciful and good to us. Can we pray together? Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings on us as your people. As we celebrate this day, the first thing is we remember is that this is your day. This is the day that you've made. We rejoice in it. We're glad in it. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, you have given us, each and every one of us that are here today. In other words, you've given us to each other. We're not just here uh, as individuals. We're here as a body. We're here as a family. And we thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in this church as we are growing together. May you be glorified. May you be honored. May you be blessed. And strengthen us, O oh God, in our understanding of your word, in our understanding of the gospel, Lord, in our ability to apply the gospel to every area of our lives so that we can pass on a living, sincere faith to those who are around us, who need encouragement, who need prayer, who need a helping hand, who need your love, who need our compassion. We thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.